Teresa McBain. Hey guys, if I stand right here, I'm blind from the light. So let me just move over to this side. Can you hear me? Is this coming through okay? I can't see you at all, so I think this is an empty room. Um, it actually kind of looks like church to me, in a way. Most everybody is in the back of the room. There are very few who are in the front. So those of you who are in the front, I'm going to be like Oprah. There's a set of car keys underneath the front row seat for you. Just look under there and, and drive your new Cadillac away, right? No, seriously. If I could afford that, uh, if I could afford that, I'd give you one. <clears throat> Today I want to talk to you just about 30 minutes or so about my journey. Some of you were in Washington, D.C. earlier this year when I came out. Thank you. <clears throat> I do apologize. I have a cold. JT said that Hemet gave it to me and that if I'd quit making out with him, I wouldn't have that problem. <laughs> My husband is watching. No, I did not make out with Hemet. I promise. <laughs> um, you were there when I came out in D.C. and I shared just a bit of my story. For those of you who were not, this is the story of, of my life. Um, in 1962, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Kuhn coined a phrase, a paradigm shift. Now, for our purposes today, I want you to think about a paradigm shift as a radical change from one way of thinking to another. Now, I know there's a lot of other applications you could throw in there, and, and some of you are science majors. Remember, I was a theology major. I have a divinity degree. I don't have a science degree, so forgive me on the science issues. Um, also, I've noticed some of you are tweeting about fonts from the speakers and their slideshows. Also, not an art major, so <laughs> we'll just get that out, out on the open right away from the beginning. If any of you would like to volunteer to help me with my slideshows, my email is tmcbain at atheist.org. Um, a paradigm shift is a radical change from one way of thinking to another. It is something that is a revolution within us, and for our purposes today, within our own selves and our own minds. It is a transformation. You could even call it a metamorphosis. And a metamorphosis is one of those words that the Christian community has kind of taken and stolen away for itself. Now, how many of you came out of a religious background? You've heard of a metamorphosis, right? What is it always equated with? Your conversion, right? It's, it's, it's when Jesus comes and he saves your soul and he changes you and saves you from the fires of hell. You've gone through a metamorphosis, right? I'm from Alabama. This means yes, that means no. Yes, okay. But a metamorphosis is more than just that. And actually, I think it probably lends itself to our topic more than it does to a religious topic because it is a process of evolution, isn't it? It is where the evolutionary process transforms a caterpillar into a butterfly, not a sinner to a saint. That's just my two cents on that one. So th this process of my paradigm shift is a process of my metamorphosis. It is something that doesn't just happen, but rather it's driven by agents of change. And that's what I'm gonna share with you guys. What were the things that m took me from the place of being a preacher's kid raised in North Alabama to becoming a pastor myself to now standing before you guys as a skeptic, as an atheist, as a humanist, as a free thinker. How did that happen? And how can you keep it? No, 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 we won't. <laughs> how did it begin for me? Well, my story begins like your story. A man and a woman met and fell in love and they had a little baby. You can see here, I've, I've brought along, can you guys over there see this cute little baby girl? I'm third, three years old here, and it's Easter Sunday. At this point in my life, I am already so in love with church, so in love with God. I can remember being this size in this picture with my brother here and thrilled that I could stand up in front of the church and quote a memory verse or sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. I just absolutely loved it and felt that doing that, I was serving God. Can you imagine a three-year-old thinking those kinds of things? But that's who I was. This picture here is of my family, and I'm probably five or six there, still have those little straight cut-across bangs. If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you know exactly what the long hair is and the straight mama just trims those bangs for you. Some of you know. Some of you are like, no, don't know anything about that. Good for you. You'd be saved from that kind of a haircut for the rest of your life. Um, 
at this age, I was going with my dad, the pastor, I was going with him out on what we called visitation. And if you were raised Baptist, you know what outreach and visitation ministry is, right? So you go and you knock on doors of people's homes that you know don't go to church or that they're, uh, which I never, I didn't even know the word atheist back then, but you didn't believe in Jesus or you didn't believe in the Jesus the way that I believed in Jesus. And so you needed to be saved. So we would go and I would go with my dad at this age, early, early age. Again, can you imagine some child doing this instead of playing Barbies or playing house, you know, the normal things that normal kids did. All right, so your first clue is, is I wasn't a normal kid. Everybody understand that? You got that picture pretty clear? Yeah, I see your heads are nodding very clearly. The only thing that I ever wanted to do with my life was to grow up and to serve God. I didn't know how that was going to happen because if you're not familiar with religion, uh, I'll just clue you in, women aren't necessarily given equal standing in religion. Women aren't always looked at as being of equal worth as men, um, especially when it comes to ministry. So I knew that I was supposed to serve God in some way, I just wasn't sure. Being a Baptist, that meant that my choices were really, really limited to teaching children, um, to teaching, to being in the choir, to leading women's groups, women's ministry groups, or maybe if it was a real liberal church, I might be able to teach a Bible study for young adults. Maybe, if it was very liberal. So I wasn't sure exactly which way I was gonna go with it, but knew that this was what God was calling me to do at that young of an age, remember that. Now, this love and desire for God led me into the Bible, of course. Where else would it lead me to? And I studied the Bible. By the time I was in the sixth grade, I had won awards for knowing more scripture passages by heart. I'm talking chapters at a time. For being able to debate with not just my age group, but teenagers. There was a, a, a club at our church and within our local churches area. It's called Sword Drills. Have any of you have ever heard that? Okay, some of you grew up in the Deep South. You know what that is. A sword drill is basically where it's a competition where you compete based upon how much Bible memory you know or how fast you can find a verse in the Bible. And you line up up front and the, the person who's leading the event calls off Romans chapter 8. And you step forward, if you know it, you step forward immediately. It's kind of like this new game, the Bible Challenge, which I would love to be on. <laughs> um, and if you, if you can quote it verbatim, word for word, King James 1611 version only, then you step up, you say it into the microphone, they count off every little thing, and you earn points for your accuracy. Um, I was very good at it. I won every competition I was ever in. And I'm not trying to brag about that because, you know, right now, oh well, so I knew the Bible. But it just points to the fact that I was the real deal. I was 100% sold out, Bible believing, Bible thumping, any other kind of phrase you want to put in there. People say to me, I have a voicemail on my phone that I just got when I was out doing a, an interview out there from a lady, and I know exactly what it's going to say. I've been thinking about you, I've been praying for you, God loves you, and it's going to lead to the fact of, well, you couldn't have ever been a really, really been a true Christian. You know, the no true Scotsman thing? This points to the fact that I really was. I was the real deal. And I studied this thing like crazy. I mean, I wore out Bibles because I studied and marked in them so much. But one day, I came up on a section of Scripture that didn't really make sense to me. In the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul, who is writing the book, is teaching in the middle of the, the, the book about how churches are supposed to be operated. What are the rules and regulations? How are you supposed to carry out business, etc., etc., etc.? Well, he's talking about women. And remember, I feel like I'm called by God to serve him in some way, so the issues that deal with women are always the ones that jump out at me. In one section, he makes a statement that all of you can finish the sentence on. He says, women keep what? Silent. Women keep silent in church. I don't permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man. Make you ladies feel good out there? You know your place now? Did I, put, did I tell you what your place is? Women keep silent in church. But then just a couple of chapters later, he says, when a woman prays, 
or prophesies in church, both, by the way, which involves speaking, and she does it with her head uncovered, she dishonors her head. So it hits me all of a sudden, wait a minute. These two things say two different, completely different things. One says that I'm supposed to keep my mouth shut, that I'm not allowed at all, zip it, you know, lock it, throw away the key. And the other one says, yes, you can stand up in church and you can pray and you can prophesy, but make sure you put on a hat, okay? So which one is it? I'm very confused. You would be confused too. So I go to my dad, the pastor, and, and I lay out my case before him, just as I shared with you, and said, hey, you know, which one is it, Dad? And he sits there for a minute, and he says, are you confused? Well, duh, yeah, I'm confused. That's why I came to talk to you. And he said, well, the Bible says, you ever heard that? The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. The Bible also says that His ways, God's ways are higher than our ways, and His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And so as human beings, we cannot even begin to understand the ways of God. These are things that you have to take by faith. So I took a message away from this encounter with my dad. And many of you wonder how some of us can get trapped into a religious cycle for so long and, and suppress those, those questions, those normal thoughts and questions, this is it right here. Doubt, this is my message, equals lack of faith, equals sin. I took away these thoughts that when I doubt, it shows a lack of faith. Remember, I love God. I love the scriptures. I feel that I've been called to serve God in some way, and that's my life. And so I don't want to be a person who doesn't have strong faith, and I definitely don't want to be someone who is a sinner or who actively has sin in their life. So what do I have to do with things? Well, I have to put them away. I have to ignore them. I have to suppress them for years. I go on through, and I'm skipping ahead through a lot of stuff, guys. I mean, this is a story that, that, that would take hours and hours and weeks and months to, to, to tell every little bit. But let's just say that I have worked through the hard stuff of dealing with the women in ministry issue and basically, in a nutshell, what I did was I threw out all the verses that said that I had to be silent, and I held on to all the ones that said I could speak in church. Classic proof texting, right? Or cherry picking. I moved on out into the real world of ministry, and I couldn't find any place that, as a woman, would let me preach, that would let me speak. I'm working in music ministry at this time, which is, is satisfying and fulfilling, but I knew that there was more I was supposed to be doing. So. I would go into prisons every Saturday morning at 6.30 a.m. for four years. I went to the women's facility and preached and prayed for women and led the singing and, and did all the things that, that a person that is ministering or a pastor would do. I went into nursing homes and did the same thing. On most Sundays, you'd find me traveling from four or five different nursing homes doing the same thing with the senior citizens. Now, the second picture uh, the third picture here in the middle, this is kind of my comic relief. All right, it's late in the conference. You guys have been here three days already. You're tired, right? You're too tired to do your nod your head thing, right? <laughs> You've heard a lot of people talk, haven't you? Oh, yeah, I see that. So it's time that you, you find out something about me. Now, I told you already how I, I grew up, that I was a Bible thumper, that I uh, was raised by a fundamentalist family, that I was going and knocking on doors and giving out those little cute chick tracks everywhere from the time I was, yeah, those, I had those, from the time I was knee high to a grasshopper, right? Well, let me just tell you just how sheltered I was. See this picture right here in the middle? Can you make out what's going on or is it too fuzzy? All right, let me break it down for you. There, there was one particular Sunday when I was going to go and preach at my church, I was a senior pastor at the time, about how people can lead you astray. There's a, a scripture that says, guard your heart with all due diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Okay, so I was going to preach on this one about how people lead you astray. And as it would happen sometimes, on the way out the door, I would get a brilliant idea. This Sunday, I had a brilliant idea on how to illustrate it. So as I'm going out the door, I reach down and pick up the dog's leash and collar. All right. 
I get to church and I'm preaching all the while thinking, oh, I can't wait to get to this point. I can't wait to get to this point. This is the most brilliant idea of illustrating that has ever been in the illustrating of any ideas. I mean, it's just the most fabulous thing. I, I'm so excited about it. Oh, Mr. President, I didn't know you were here. I'm so sorry. I didn't acknowledge you. Um, some of you are a little slow today, I really have to say. <laughs> so I get to church, and, and I'm going through the sermon, and I call my husband up about halfway through. Yeah, it was really funny, huh? <laughs> and he's used to it. I make fun of him. I use him for illustrations all the time. But he wasn't prepared for what was happening next. He comes up on stage. I'm talking. I'm doing my thing. I'm so thrilled. This is going to be like the greatest moment of my preaching career ever. And it was a great moment, let me tell you. So I'm talking about people leading you astray, and I reach up and I put the dog's collar on his neck and then attach the, the, the leash and keep talking, feeling like I'm a million bucks, and lead him around the stage and just keep leading him around the stage thinking that this is so great. People are really going to get this. As soon as I leave church, people are shaking my hands. I'm thinking like, wow, yeah, you know it, you know it, I'm good, I'm the bomb, I did it, you know. Get in the car and there's a voicemail from the chairman of the board that says, I need to talk to you as soon as possible. And it's not a, oh, that was such a great illustration. How did you come up with it? I want to congratulate you. It was, you're in deep doo-doo. That was the comment that he was going to, the, the, the voicemail message that he was leaving me. I looked at my husband. I'm like, what is this all about? What is going on here? I don't understand. This was such a great thing that I did here. And he's like, Honey, you really don't know what it means to put a dog collar on a man, do you? <laughs> nope, I had no clue. So this is the brain that, that you're dealing with here, okay? Just to frame everything for you and give you just that kind of mid-talk laugh, I really was, and in some ways, am still that sheltered. Why? Because of religious indoctrination. Because of being that young girl growing up all throughout my life being so invested in it because of that message that I got when I was studying for my dad that that doubt equals lack of faith equals sin how can somebody get so trapped for so long logical thinking intelligent people that that refuse to even consider there could be another way that's how it happens you refuse to let anything else in because it's wrong because it's a sin well, as I work through this process of ordination into ministry, I, I find myself in the Methodist church um, with some friends. I'm doing worship music at this particular Methodist church and become friends with a lady who's going through to be a pastor. And she continually talks to me. and She's like, Teresa, you really need to, to come through the Methodist church. The Methodist church is more liberal. And I was progressing toward the more liberal side of theology at this point. Um, you, you know, we need good women ministers like you. So I listened to her and I started reading things by John Wesley. He made this one statement that really was kind of the beginning of a life change for me. You know, talk about those agents of change that, that drive the paradigm shift. Well, this was one of them for me. Wesley made a statement, in the essentials, unity, in the non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Now, this is a pretty good life motto for everybody you know, if you just strip the religion away from it. But for me, at this point, it was the perfect catalyst, so to speak, that I needed for the next step in my journey. Because here's what it let me do. It let me say, okay, the essentials are these basic core tenets of the Christian faith, which are, you know, God the Father, Jesus Christ His only Son, the Holy Spirit, um, dead, buried, resurrected, will come again, just the, the basics. Everything else is left up to my interpretation. He made another statement. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, though we may not all think alike, may we not all love alike. And that was it for me. That was it. These two things combined uh, didn't create Wonder Twin powers. See how many of you are old enough to know that one? A few. Didn't create Wonder Twin powers, but it did allow me to start thinking. I had permission from the Christian church to dig up all that stuff that I had suppressed for so many years to start thinking about it and think, boy, did I think. I sat down 
old school, took out a pen and paper and would just write for hours, filling notebooks of contradictions, of things I just couldn't understand, writing out questions of things, you know, how could this have happened? What does this really mean? Surely God didn't just say that or do that. That can't be right. How, you know, trying to work through to make some sense out of it. Hours and hours and hours and days and weeks and months. Um, it, it took me very, very long time. It was the very first step for me in my process of becoming an atheist. Now, I didn't know it at the time. At the time, I thought I was just going to be that much smarter, that much wiser, that much more mature Christian, and I would be that much better of a pastor. So that when you came to me with the same questions that I had, I would have the answers. I would be able to help you but it didn't quite work out that way for me. So I dealt with these issues of the Bible, and eventually I had to come to the conclusion there was no other conclusion that could be made. The Bible was absolutely flawed. I mean, it had more holes than Swiss cheese, and there's no way that I could pick the Bible up anymore and say, take this, this will help you with your life, this is all you need, which is what the faith had told me for so many years. The next thing that really kind of happened about the same time was this theology of hell. You ever heard of hell? You ever been threatened with hell? Recently, I've been threatened with it a lot. A, a lot. Um, as Peanut would say Jeff Dunham, a lot. Um, I get to thinking about how ridiculous it is that, that a deity would create humanity or whatever we are compared to the deity. And that, that that person, thing, being, entity, whatever, would say, okay, you got 70, maybe 80 years if you're lucky to figure it out. And if you don't, oh, so sorry, I'm going to burn you forever. And forever. And did I say forever? Uh, I got to think about my own kids. I have two sons. One's 22, one's 25. My sons um, were not perfect, not by a long shot. Um, I would get a knock on the door many times, especially with my oldest son. Mr. McBain, yes. Um, we need to have a talk with you because your son was just in a fight on the playground with so-and-so. Uh, he always got into fights. He loved to fight. Um, I, I think he probably still does, but he knows he'd get arrested now. Um, but never once did I think about taking him out at the school and taking him out to the playground and say, okay, son, I've got to teach all these kids a lesson and teach you a lesson. So here, I'm going to pour gasoline on you and I'm going to set you on fire and you'll never forget that you are not to disobey me. Never once entered my mind to do that, ever, never. So if I'm a human being, remember, I'm still a Christian, I'm still saying that I believe in the Bible and I'm still looking for the truth about God, if I, as a human being, poor, poor little human being, if I wouldn't think of doing that, then how could I believe in a God that would do that? So I did what has worked for me so far. I just chunked that part away, you know. Okay, cut that part out. Do the Jefferson Bible thing. All right, I'll cut those pages out. I'm not going to believe that anymore. I get to thinking about religion next, thinking about, well, if my sacred text, the Bible, is so full of holes that I can't put any faith or trust in it, if this theology and doctrine of hell, which is used to keep us in line all the time, if it's just hogwash, then what about religion? Why is it that I have the, the arrogance or the right to think that I'm right and you're wrong? So I, I quickly moved into a place to where I said, no, okay, every religion is equally valid. They don't have the answers. But they're all seeking God, and it's basically uh, the, the basis or the framework for it is where you were raised. I was raised in South Alabama, or North Alabama in the South, so I was a Baptist. Someone who's raised uh, overseas in the Middle East might be Jewish or Muslim. You know, it just depends on how you were raised and what your, your beliefs were as a child growing up in your family. So that held me for about a week. For about a week, I could hold on to that. But it didn't last long because this last little piece was, again, one of those agents, agents of change. But for me, it was probably the straw that broke the cam camel's back. And it's this little thing called theodicy. Now, for those of you, this is my Greek word for the day that's going to make me look really smart, my religious word for the day that makes me look smart. This is not the idiotacy of theology, okay? Although there's a lot of merit in that, this is not what that is. It is the problem of evil. It is the one question, even if people who are religious can, can uh, 
argue away all the other pieces of the Bible, they can't give you an answer as to why little children, little girls are taken and sold into slavery, into sex slave, as sex slaves. They can't answer the question as to why you know, Hurricane Sandy just came and, and hit in the area of the country where I'm at. They can't answer why children and adults and people of all shapes and sizes and beliefs, you know, religious people, non-religious people, why they were killed in that storm or why they lost everything. This is one of those things that as a pastor, I hoped and prayed you would never come and ask me about because I didn't have an answer. And internally, I struggled with it myself. Uh, didn't deal with it often because, you know, suppression, that's, that's the name of the game. Ignore it. Just don't even deal with it. Uh, if it's something you don't have an answer to. So I thought about it and I read um, and I came across a statement by a gentleman that you may have heard of. His name is Epicurus. <clears throat> he said, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Let me tell you, that word for me was a hard pill to swallow, saying that God was malevolent. Although, looking back, you know, I agree with it. Is he both able and willing, then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing, and here was the moment for me, then why call him God? It all came down to it. And this was about a year ago. This was just about a year ago, where it all, all that, those years of suppressing and then coming to the point to where I could question and thinking and no longer feeling for the most part that those doubts, those questions would make me a sinner. I think I still held on to it a little bit, but it, it all kind of came to a head at this point. Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? This is how I lived my life. I lived in a bubble. This is my bubble girl. This is a Christian bubble. What exists within a Christian bubble? Well, Christian music, the Bible, Christian books, Christian authors, Christian activities like church camp, like youth group, definitely not prom, definitely not the party after the football game, you know, definitely not dances or any of those other ungodly things because you know what dancing is, right? Sex. Sex standing up, that's right. Uh, I did know that part, even though I didn't know the dog collar part. Um, everything that is within the Christian bubble is things that are the only things that are approved for a Christian. Because if you ever step outside that Christian bubble, then you expose yourself to attack from the enemy, and he might steal your faith. Well, how can he steal it? If it's really the way, the truth, and the life, if it's 100%, I mean, how could it be damaged if you question? How could it be damaged or destroyed if you just think about it or you step outside of the little bubble? Well, that's where I found myself. You can see my little crack there. I started to allow myself outside of that. After I dealt with those four little issues, I started to let myself out of this little bubble. Bart Ehrman was the first person that I encountered outside of my bubble. I needed to find answers and I needed to find I needed to know, really, if what I was thinking was crazy or not. Does that make any sense to you? I needed to have some kind of... Um, I just needed to know that there was somebody out there that was just as nutso as I was. And I found you all. Ehrman was safe territory for me because, you know, he's a theologian. He deals with scripture. That was, that's kind of my forte. Um, and I found with him not necessarily things that I didn't know already, but I found that, um, that acceptance, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the right word for it, but I found that place of saying, ah, oh, yes, what I was thinking, the affirmation, the affirmation of, yes, what I have been thinking all along is right. Yes, what I have been struggling with. Remember, I haven't talked to a human being yet, with the exception of myself. Yes, I talk to myself. Sometimes I answer myself, too. It's an interesting thing when that happens. Um, but Bart Ehrman's books confirmed those kinds of things for me. And then I came across this other guy who's actually here. I don't know if you've ever heard of him at all. His name is Richard Carrier. Anybody heard of him? 
Now, let me just reiterate at this moment that I have a degree in divinity. And while it is a graduate degree, I'm not the most keen scientist or mathematician. So, Richard, I have to say that Bayes' theorem, I still don't understand it. Um, I, I, but his work on the historicity of Jesus, his work on, uh, well, you've heard it. You've listened to his podcast. I mean, that was my daily bread for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks was listening to Richard's uh, works, reading his blog, reading his books. Um, and I found that the parts of me that needed to get outside of that bubble, that needed to find some answers, that I was actually finding some things, and I was actually understanding for once in my life truth without any kind of religious strings attached. I look back over my life, and, you know, I told you guys I was born and raised in North Alabama. I don't remember if they ever mentioned evolution or evolutionary theory or Darwin at all in my school. If they did, it was in passing just so they could say they fulfilled what was necessary. Now remember this is back in the 70s. We were still saying prayers in school. We were still having Bible readings and devotionals by our teachers. I mean, you know, and they may still be doing it now, actually. I don't know. Um, I went to a Christian college, and then I went to a divinity school. So. I really didn't get a lot of, of attention in my educational process on anything scientific, especially dealing with evolution. So I felt like it might be to my advantage to go back and read it. And to read it without that presupposition of, oh, evolution is just a theory. We know that God created the earth in the literal seven days, and the earth is only 6,000 years old. And yeah, I believed all that. I'm sorry. I have to confess. So at this point, I needed to connect with another person. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I'm really desperate. This, again, is probably just about a year ago. I was desperate. I haven't talked to anybody. I have been trapped inside my head all this time, which is a very, very scary place. Um, so I Googled on the Internet pastors who feel that they've lost their faith. And bing, Dan Barker pops up, first and foremost. His book, Godless, is listed right there. I downloaded it onto my iPad on my Kindle and read it within just an hour or two. And I'm not exaggerating. I know preachers exaggerate a lot, but that's not a preacher exaggeration. Um, I didn't know what to do at the end of that book. I just knew that I had to find this person. At the end, of course, there is the Freedom From Religion Foundation contact number. I called that number. And would you believe Dan called me back in about an hour? I mean, just, it's like, hello, my name is Dan Barker. You left a message for me. Uh, yeah, I did. Um, didn't know if I could trust him still. And I guess he knew that because he just started right there and he shared his story with me for about an hour. And I shared my story with him and we just talked and we talked and we talked. First physical, alive, real human person that I ever spoke to uh, about where I was with my faith or lack thereof was Dan. And he was so kind. And he shared with me about this new thing that had just launched called the Clergy Project. Uh, the Clergy Project, if you haven't heard of it, it's just an online support group for pastors who are just like me, who were struggling with their faith, who have walked away, who no longer hold a belief in the supernatural, a agnostic, atheist, um, just a bunch of us crazy preachers, basically, who were trying to find a way out, who were trying to deal with it. Um, and, and I became, you know, he said, do you want to be a part of it? And I'm like, told my dad, duh, yeah, of course I do. So I got, you know, logged in, I got connected with this community and immediately started talking away, meeting people, realizing there's this pastor, and of course we all have false names, and they're all so creative. We have Adam and we have Eve, and, and we have Esther, and we have Ruth. Yeah, yeah, we're a bunch of preachers, you can tell it. Um, but I connected in immediately with a, a guy who is still in the closet. Uh, his wife has some pretty, pretty serious health issues, and you know, can you imagine feeling trapped, knowing that you've put X number of years in, and if you leave, pre-existing condition is gonna keep your seriously disabled wife from health care? I didn't have that position to be in. I, wow, I mean, he just, his story really, really, really tears me up inside. Um, well, he and I became friends.
pretty quickly online. Uh, yes, honey, I have an online friend. Uh, I have a lot, actually. Um, and he talked to me a lot and tried to help me try to figure out an escape plan and an, an exit strategy. And we talked a lot about books. He's a big reader. I was a big reader. And remember, I don't know who any people, any of these people are. I didn't know who Dan Barker was. I had no idea who Richard Carrier was or Bart Ehrman or anybody else. I just knew they wrote a book. That's all I knew. I didn't know that they were Dan Barker or Richard Carrier. And I had no idea. Uh, so. My friend in the clergy project says, well, have you ever heard of Richard Dawkins? I'm like, no, I've heard of Stephen Hawking, but I don't know any Richard Dawkins. Who is this dude? And he said, well, I won't spoil it for you. You need to read one more book. And so I downloaded The God Delusion. Now, again, let me just say, I have a degree in theology, not in science, definitely not in evolutionary biology. So I did not read Mr. Dawkins' book in an hour, or two hours, or a week. <laughs> it took me a while. I had to read a chapter and go back and go, what the heck did this guy just say? Um, but yeah, really, seriously, that book is a great book, and it was really eye-opening for me. I probably need to go back and read it a few more times just so that I can talk intellectually on it and sound like I know something besides Bible verses. Um, all of these things led up to this final piece of my paradigm shift. And I've put up my favorite picture, I think, not, not my favorite picture of all time, but maybe my favorite picture of all atheist time. Um, this is just a few moments after I came out on stage at the American Atheist Convention. Uh, Dave Silverman, the president of American Atheists, ran up on stage and gave me about the best big brother hug I think I've ever had in my life. The audience, as I stood in front of them, many of you were there. I see your faces. I know you. Um, you're my friends on Facebook now, which is really cool. Um, you had just heard the words from me, hi, my name is Lynn, but that's not my real name. It's the only name the atheist community has known me by, but today, and I take my name tag off my name, I'm coming out and telling you my name is Teresa McBain. I'm an atheist, uh, was formerly a Methodist pastor, but now I'm, I'm out and I'm among you. And I spent the next few minutes just apologizing for all those things that I talked about earlier, about being six years old and knocking on your door and wanting to convert you to my brand of Christianity. <laughs> I mean, I still can't believe I did that. I was like, wow. What was I thinking? I was six years old. I was not thinking at all. So I said those words. Dave came up. He gave me, like I said, the best hug I think I've ever had. All of those who were gathered in that, that auditorium that day leapt. I don't think I'm exaggerating with preacher exaggeration there either. Leapt to the feet, clapping. Two minutes, three minutes, I don't know. It seemed like an eternity. Just absolutely blowing me away with kindness. This embrace represents what the atheist, the free thought, the skeptic, the humanist community has been to me. It has been nothing but one warm embrace. The Christian community, after I came out, not so much, not so much. <laughs> so where am I now? Well, obviously I came out. I had to go home. I found myself <laughs> in lots of trouble. The news like to pick on me and people like to talk about hell to me again. There's that hell thing. And my favorite one uh, is a man that I had worked with in Christian retreat ministry. This is where we would go into a three-day retreat. People would come as candidates and go through this, and our goal was to make them stronger Christians. Now, he was a leader, and I was a leader. He sent me a voicemail, or called me and left a voicemail and said, well, I just saw your little video. This is North Florida, South Georgia. I hope you're proud of yourself, but let me just tell you, I can't wait till the day I'm in heaven and I can stand up there and look down on you in hell and watch the flesh burn off your body. <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? Yeah, Christian love at its finest. Needless to say, I now live in a new city. <laughs> American atheists, this is the funniest irony of all ironies, I think. Going from fundamentalist Baptist child growing up in a, just an extremely conservative home to being a pastor myself to now being public relations director for American atheists. I mean, isn't that just hilarious?
I have new friends. Many of you come up and say, hi, I, you know, and I see your face. I'm like, oh, I know you. You're my friend on Facebook. You know, when I was coming out and, or after I came out and going through those extremely difficult months, every day I would have multiple private messages on my Facebook, people saying, how are you doing? I know it's got to be tough for you. Are you hanging in there? How's your husband and how's your kids? Uh, they would have seen a post or heard an interview or something and would ask about this piece or that piece. I mean, just amazing. Who knew that people who didn't believe in God were so kind and loving? I never knew it. Matter, actually, I never knew anybody who wasn't a believer in God, so it doesn't, <laughs> that kind of cancels that one out. Now, I want you to take away just a couple of things. I want you to understand that I'm really not anything special. I'm just a person who was dumb enough to stand up in front of 1,500 people and say, hey there, I'm an atheist. <laughs> uh, I, I, I am, I'm just an average person. You know, I'm, somebody stopped by and said good morning to me this morning when I was having my first cup of coffee and eating breakfast. And I really was trying to be nice because I'm not a morning person. I, you know, I, I was trying not to growl and go, arr, 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 get away, get away. I'm just like you. There's nothing special about me. Uh, I, I drive a Volkswagen for crying out loud. I mean, you know, yeah, there you go. But you know what? I have a voice. And I'm not the only one. You have a voice. And in my opinion, it's time that we used each of our voices to stand up. It's time we stood up. We've taken a beating for way too many years. And you know, I've only been taking this beating part of it for about seven months now. Some of you have been at it for years and years and years. And you have made it easier for me to stand up and say the things that I'm saying. And I thank you for that. I really do appreciate it. Um, but we each have our part. We need to stand up. We need to stand out. Not be afraid to be who we are. To believe the way that we believe or don't believe the way that we believe. To honestly show the world what atheists are. You remember that picture of the embrace? I could probably take that into a church and they'd be like, no, no atheist did that. Uh-uh. No. They, they, they're sinners. They're heathens. They're ungodly. Well, I guess we are ungodly. Yeah. <laughs> stand up, stand out, and speak out. It doesn't matter whether you are invited to speak on stage at Skepticon, which, by the way, is awesome, awesome, awesome. <laughs> or if you're just standing outside talking to the folks who were so kind to come and visit us and do like I've done so many times in my past, convert you to my brand of Christianity. We each... When we do that, we can definitely make shift happen. Thank you.